Welcome to the Stoa. The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. All right. Oof. Friday nights with Pat at the Stoa. Um, uh, yeah. So I'm Peter Limburg, the steward of the Stoa. And this is a place where we cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the nice edge of this moment. And uh, today we have probably the, the baddest man on the internet, Pat Ryan. <laughs> um, <laughs> and he's going to give a, a talk on trauma drama, um, which I'm 10% nervous about. Uh, so uh, what's going to happen is Pat's going to uh, do uh, um, share his thoughts, and then we're going to open up to Q and A. If you have questions for Pat, just write in the chat box, and then uh, uh, yeah, I'll unmute you and you can ask it to Pat. That being said, I hand it over to you, my friend. Hey, folks! Thanks for round two, and thanks for bringing me back. Always appreciate it. Uh, I'll, I'll do my previous format where I explain what I'm going to do, and then we'll just walk right through it. Peter and I had a, a great discussion, a continuing discussion actually, about uh, certain topics regarding how people are influenced and how they're made suggestible. Um, is that even true? Is hypnosis a thing? Are these conspiracy theories true about how you can make people a Manchurian candidate? Um, of course, those are the contemporary tropes we have when we talk about such concepts. Um, but what if it wasn't so insidious? What if you didn't need that level of malicious intent to get those type of results? What if we were actually doing that all the time anyways and we just didn't even know it? Um, so we kind of landed on this concept called the trauma drama, um, where the stance that I'm going to take is that trauma is actually essential to the brain. This is a very complicated and very controversial thing to say because we all have varying spectrums of, of either trauma, abuse, or terrible things that have happened to us. And I'm not, this is in no way designed to undermine or, un, or make light of any of that. This is designed to explore the neural evolution of how trauma even came to be, why we even have the capacity for it. Um, and at the end, there might be, if I convey this correctly, I will display the last slide without any words, and we'll just see what happens. So, uh, Without much more, I am ready to begin. Let me go share my screen. <coughs> this one. Share. Give me a pointer. And then, okay. So, trauma, drama. Um, start as a little monkey and end up an alcoholic. That's just how it goes. So moving on to the next slide. Trauma, start with the words, right? I'm not gonna defeat the idea that trauma is, is, uh, is something that needs to be redefined, um, that it's too personal. So I'm gonna start in the personal. And the way to start at the personal is, is, a, is a homocentric concept called a definition. So here we start with uh, where, what it means. It means a wound uh, to hurt, actually, its root comes from to rub or turn, as in like, like irritate, like to grab someone, like do this, right? That, that's an important understanding uh, if we're going to cling to the idea that trauma is this personal experience. Um, and we're highlighting it, in, right? So there's two highlights. Um, because it implies that it's non-fatal. It's not wound to kill. It's wound to irritate. Um, wait, trauma. Hey, you drew that. Don't you... <laughs> I do not approve. Um, wait, does someone have edit privileges? Am I being trolled? Oh boy. Mm. So anyway, um, because it's non-fatal and it's personal, it is automatically implied to be homocentric and anthropogenic as a byproduct. So trauma is things that humans do to humans. And that's as far as the conversation tends to go. Uh, we don't look at it from other spectrums or domains uh, because again, it's, it's incredibly personal. Uh, and intoxicatingly so. So it's very hard to, you know, remove yourself from that kind of experience. It's very compelling uh, when it comes to that. So, uh, boy, that yellow line, that yellow. If anybody did that, can you please undo that? That'd be... 
Uh, yeah, how, how do people do that? Uh, I, think they're, I think they're kindly highlighting something. Okay, um, I didn't know if they could do that. Uh, please stop doing that. <laughs> <laughs> if you could undo it, that'd be keen. I don't know if you can. It's just gonna be this yellow circle that's in the recording the whole time. It's gonna be weird. Anybody's a pro at uh, pro at Zoom, that would be super cute. But I'll keep going until someone figures it out. All right, so uh, what I decided to do is continue with the anthropogenic and um, the homocentric definition of trauma. And we'll start with the history of psychology, which is where trauma therapy even, thank you for removing that, um, uh, where, the, where the history of this research even comes from. And a lot of these are gonna be a little bit academic, but I'm gonna focus on what's important about these things, the red lines that just happen to appear. Um, trauma research comes from trying to defeat the, the Victorian British menace of hysteria in women. That's where it actually starts. So um, the, the British Victorians were very keen of their industrial accomplishments and their imperial conquest of the lessers and their hopes that they could modernize them. Um, except these damn women just wouldn't stop crying all the time. Um, and that's as far as they looked at it. And that was pretty premature to even come to that conclusion, but they did it anyway. Uh, of course, they were wildly wrong in their prescription, um, but this is where the concept of studying trauma originates from, at least in the West, in the modern West, I should say, I should, I should punctuate that. Um, so it starts from trying to make very upset women less upset, not by dealing with their actual issues, of course, um, but more like poking and prodding them like subjects and all the inefficiencies that that unfortunately led to. Um, so let's see, click again, uh, which then leads us to, oh, I gotta read that one second. <clears throat> it led to premature categorization of the problem. So hysteria was too wide of an umbrella. It didn't, it wasn't descriptive enough. It was it just, it's too broad. So you had two different people, Janae and Fraud, uh, Fra sorry, did I say fraud? I didn't mean to say fraud. That must've been a Freudian slip, <laughs> no pun intended. Um, but the, uh, there was two different schools of thought. Uh, you had disassociation and you had double consciousness. So again, the, these imply two totally different things. They imply that there's another spirit within you, right? So disassociation means you have multiple spirits in you and you can only pick one at a time. So I'm either going to be me or I'm going to disassociate into some other spirit. Double consciousness means they operate in parallel and they're influencing each other. So th these, are, these are two high level categorizations of hysteria. And that's what they settled on. They were, they were, they were like a pro, they were like blindfolding themselves and trying to shoot a target and incrementing themselves towards something more relevant. So I'm not trying to forgive. I'm not trying to create a, a basis in which we then you know, explain the way and forgive them for all the very poor um, conclusions that their research has led to. I'm just trying to let you know where their brain was anachronistically, so we can make sense of why we have so many misconceptions on the concept of trauma. Um, this is again compounding the, the British Victorian fixation on trying to make women more compliant to the rapid changes of the industrial period. Um, and it kind of led to a bit of a backfire. He, he was deciding this, he was basically stating that uh, the hysteria in women was was a byproduct of uh, fantasies of sexual abuse. And oh, some of these women were sexually abused. No, just kidding, they actually weren't abused. But it was a bit of a problem. It was, there, there was no experimental discipline or rigor. There was no peer review. Uh, it was just one guy running around saying, hey, these things are happening. And people just bought into it because of a celebrity. Uh, and yeah, it's just a mess, an utter mess. This is not how you conduct these types of research into people. But, but we all know that. I'm not really teaching anything new here. I'm just giving you context. So, uh, let's see, this is, right. So it was once again considered that perhaps it wasn't just women doing this. Were men actually doing this too? And the answer from most of the research was no, and that changed with World War I. So with the advent of fully industrialized mechanical warfare in mass, I think 20% of Europeans' male population died in the four years of World War I. Um, the concept of rolling artillery was devastating people. Uh, men would go into the front lines, they would be exposed to the horrors of industrial warfare, whether it was gas attacks, um, consistent rolling artillery barrages, uh, sniper fire, living in per permanent panic, um, 
trench foot getting lice and mites sitting around in the dirt, uh, infection, all the, all the forces of just horrors were inflicted on everyone at the same time across multiple countries for the French, for the British, for the Germans, uh, for, the, for the Slavic bloc as well. Anybody who participated in that war, it was a full mobilized war, so they threw all of their males into it. So in addition to having um, these highly industrialized nations, their women going and having hysterical breakdowns as a byproduct of the reconfiguration of family life and the reconfiguration of um, industrial alignment, now it was the men's turn because they could all experience it at the same time. So the women were experiencing this initially. Now it was the men's turn. They were dumped into it because of the war. So now they were starting to express in mass and in, uh, uh, in synchrony all of the trauma that women were also showing the same behaviors for. And this unfortunately had a, had a very negative side effect on the research of trauma because this is it's just this is terrible stuff. Um, because women were associated with hysteria, when men were displaying the behaviors of hysteria, they were considered cowards because they were acting like women. And so it completely interfered with the ability to research trauma, which is, again, another one of those, first they miscategorized, at first they were too broad, and then they took an entire subset and they miscategorized it, and so they just pissed it away, just blew it out the window. Right? So they were given these two massive sample sizes, uh, the early researchers, and these, they didn't know what to do with it. Uh, whether it was malice or incompetence or a little bit of both, you know, we can argue that all day. Uh, now, men and women are now finally displaying this kind of thing, this trauma, this, this unknown at the time human behavior that we're going through. But was it universal? Was it all men and all women? What about different cultures? Do different cultures display trauma in different manners? Well, it turns out the Irish were different about it. They didn't like showing pain traditionally. Uh, North Americans were very stoic about it. They were like, oh, I'm, I'm sick. I should go to the doctor and then I should diagnose myself as objectively as possible and leave my emotions out of it so I can get the proper uh, advice, the medical advice. And then some of the Europeans, the stereotype of the loud Italian, like, oh, God, I'm so broken, right? So, so these, every culture is very different in how they express pain, which gives a clue about, about the trauma. Uh, how trauma, it, how can you have this objective how can you begin to apply an objective metric to something that culture is so heavily influencing? It's tough. It's a really tough question. Uh, let's see. And then you get to non-European nations, Nigerians. Nigerians, for example, it's a sensation of heat or writhing maggots. It's not even like this personal loss. It's, it's not like, oh, I went through this thing and therefore, no, it's like this thing is happening to me. Right? It's not coming from me. It's happening to me. That's a very different way of, of, of how trauma is interpreted or looked at. Um, you get to the Middle East, and especially when you get to Turkey and, and uh, Syria and Iraq, then it gets off the rails because their, their cultures are old enough to have points of reference about things that reach all the way back into antiquity. So as a result, to them, um, there is no difference between trauma as a mental pain and as a physical pain. To them, it's all physical. So when, when this particular research was done, the people who were, who were demonstrating traumatic results like PTSD or any type of uh, psychological compensation from an event of trauma, they were actually putting their bodies in a state as if they were physically ill. So they would sit there like balled up in a corner. They'd, they walk really differently, but they would convey to, they, they had this way of conveying to their own peers that something was wrong with them, as opposed to, you know, stiff upper lips type of thing. Um, so each culture had a different strategy of expressing, defining, and ultimately experiencing trauma. Now that, that unfortunately goes against the narrative of trauma being this big personal thing. It's my personal journey. Um, and it's very difficult to get the objectiveness of it when you look at it from this level. So, so far, uh, and again, right here, this is another position that's basically stating that um, trauma from Western constructs and Western research is individual in the focus, uh, but social and political realities can be a root of it. But if you're looking at it from individual sense, like something's wrong with me or something happened to me, um, then you're going to not look at the social context that may be causally involved. 
whether it's the source of it or the root is a, is another discussion entirely. But but those elements do influence um, trauma type of uh, expressing and evolving through a person. So this puts us in a in kind of a tough spot because trauma as scientific psychology is a European concept. It's uh, and that European concept is kind of predominant, especially when it comes to things like psychiatry and, and drug prescription and medication. Um, the, the idea that all brains are the same and we all have these equal brains and we all have equal cultures is, is actually interfering with the research of trauma. Um, and that's uncomfortable and hard to have that conversation without it turning into a political blowout. Um, but I'm, I'm citing what I can to, to mitigate that type of thing. So we've covered European men, European women, different European cultures, an African culture, Middle Eastern cultures, and it's pretty, it's a broad spectrum, right? There's a lot going on in the human condition, it turns out, uh, and culture is playing a role in how trauma is perceived, experienced, and defined. So there's an instinct here because we won't give up this, God damn it, we will never give this up. We will die by it. We will wipe out the world to make sure that scientific psychology is true. Um, and God damn it, we don't care what the cost will be because fuck. Uh, so when you're approached with this question, how do we find a baseline? How do we find a baseline? Where is this mythical person that is independent of culture? How can we identify this one being in which we can then nullify or at least identify and do differential analysis on regarding trauma? And the answer is absolutely fucking miserable. Use children before they hit culture. Now, children do acquire culture fairly rapidly, but not at all ages. There's a gap between like zero and two and three. Um, and this goes into a dark place pretty fucking quick. So I'll get into this dark space and I promise I'll immediately bounce out of it. Um, so you had child sexual abuse. That's a thing. That's also considered a post-traumatic stress disorder just based on the expression of behavior when a child goes through it. Uh, they are displaying the same maladaptive functioning as female rape survivors and male combat veterans. Again, going back to that British Victorian challenge space that they were trying to originally apply trauma to. So they had, they had to go back to pre-Freud and Freud and say, okay, we're seeing the same behavior here. Um, maybe children also get it too, because that children as a control group um, pre-culture can act as that sort of way to do the differential analysis between other cultures. Um, so then you get into the more uh, detailed of uh, detailed results of what children go through, uh, poor impulse control, aggressive, uh, difficulty with interpersonal relationships, you guys can read. So uh, the research is done. It has been done for the past probably 70 years at this point. Uh, I would consider it a fairly dark chapter in this type of research. Um, there's still plenty of children who were subjected to not only controlled examples of these experiments, uh, but also uncontrolled. Uh, if you look at the way mass media works, which we will get there eventually uh, during this talk. But uh, they're displaying PT, children can't do display PTSD uh, when they are put under sustained abuse. Now, this implies that independent of culture, there is something about the human brain that is that has either ways to deal with stress or is reacting to stress uh, or, um, or something unexplained, right? So let's get out of this dark place. I personally don't like being here. So let's go find other baselines instead. Um, let's take some presumptions before we get there. What if it is an anthropogenic? What if we've been wrong about this whole time? All of our research has been about looking at how trauma affects people and how people apply trauma to people, and it's all people oriented. What, what if, what if nature fucks us up? What if, like, I don't know, a lightning bolt hits my uncle? It's pretty traumatic, right? That didn't come from a person; it came from Thor or something like that, right? So, what if it isn't homocentric? What if humans aren't the only things going through trauma? I think that's a valid question. What if non-human mammals? also go through trauma, like dogs or elephants. That's, that's a fair assumption. I think enough of us have pets or worked in farms to have seen that. Uh, so let's leave the children alone for a generation. Scientists, thanks. Let's, let's go look at animals, right? Um, 
maybe it's their turn to, to be poked on the project. Uh, so there's a lot of examples. I'm going to be in and out of this one too because this gets dark as well. Uh, African elephants demonstrate PTSD when they see their herd get culled or killed in bulk. Um, they have differences in how they interact with the herds they then uh, integrate with. Their ability to follow age-related cues gets completely shattered. Um, they demonstrate depression as far as one can, like putting their head against the wall, for example, repeatedly banging their head against the wall, they will do that. Um, so it turns out that social mammals, not just humans, are also displaying signs of trauma. Again, the question keeps coming back. Is this fundamentally neurological? Is this part of the, the animal brain? Is this like this person's brain? Is it this culture's brain? Or is there something fundamental to how the brain has been organized in which trauma exists. Um, and then there is another example, which there is another example regarding animals uh, involving a monkey, which was the saddest goddamn thing I've seen all week. Uh, and I decided not to put it in here, but I'll give you a baseline. It was, it was a 10 year study on a lab chimp who was subjected to, I think, 10 years of bioweapons experimentation. So putting different viruses and diseases and seeing it that, and it wasn't even trauma from, like, it wasn't like smacking someone. It was putting that chimp into a state where they're constantly in disease for 10 years straight. And even then trauma happened. So even if your immune system was compromised in some way from the jump, you will still, your brain will still start to um, develop these trauma responses. And again, it was, it was like 20 pages of the saddest shit you'll ever read. So I'm, I'm just not going to put it in here. Uh, you can, you don't have to take my word for it, but you can look it up. Uh, okay, so social mammals are going through this too. Trauma is happening here. All right, so we got humans, we got men, women, children, different cultures, mammals. Okay, that's a lot, but it's not enough. The reason it's not enough is because, well, what if it's not only for mammals? We're trying to answer where trauma comes from, so now we have to look outside of mammals. What if it's, what about animals who don't have complex socialization? Um, Elephants have it, and dogs have it, cats have it, we have it. What about things like, I don't know, ants, where it's just like genetic caste system and the communication is just pheromones? Uh, what if this whole idea of trauma being local and trauma being personal, what if it turns out that it's actually universal and a byproduct of biology? That would be uncomfortable, uh, but it would open up the avenue of where to look to answer these questions that, that I'm raising right now. So let's start using non-mammal social animals who don't resemble our neural trajectory at all. Uh, so things that don't have human capacity or social mammals or things that are freaking alien, like fish, right? So even Petco says, hey, fish get traumatized, get stressed out, and they demonstrate it, right? So I didn't know fish could get traumatized. That didn't even dawn on me. Like I knew all the other stuff, but it's a fish, right? But apparently fish get upset they prescribe that the way to fix a fish when they're upset is to fix their environment, surprisingly, because um, they're in a tiny little like, cube of water and their pH balance could be wrong or nutrients could be wrong or whatever, anything could happen there. So Petco has a real pragmatic, it, it's, they didn't intend for this to be part of this discussion, I'm sure, um, but it's a pragmatic approach to, it's in, it's an innocently pragmatic approach to how to deal with stress for something. Um, and there's, there's a lot more here if you decide to read into it, the idea of fixing the environment to fix the fish as opposed to fixing the fish, uh, which is what the, in, the individual responsibility of trauma dictates that we should do. So I, I found that to be rather interesting. <clears throat> ants, you think ants don't go through trauma and you'd be wrong. So the way that there's a particular group of ants in Africa, uh, the Matabele, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Um, they have to go to war every day with, with termites around their colonies uh, to get food. So they're, they're in, invasive carnivores from the jump. It's just the way their geodestiny has set them out to be. Um, and when they are wounded because of these constant fighting, 
uh, they lose limbs. There are many limbed creatures and they lose them. And when they lose the limb, they spit out some chemical substance and they're all buddies say, oh my God, it's George, he's wounded. Let's go pick him up and carry him back. Uh, but it doesn't end there. There's some additional stuff about this trauma response. And that's also interesting. Um, once it's there, they then proceed to do medical prep on the ant. Uh, now you'd think these ants are breeding at a rate that's stupendous, like 10,000, 20,000 a day. Why even bother salvaging a single ant? Well, ants appear to make the calculation that that's a good idea. Um, we shouldn't just told, we shouldn't put the burden exclusively on the queen's ability to create more ants. We should salvage what we can. And that's only possible because of trauma signaling. So now we're starting to see, okay, perhaps there's a function to trauma as opposed to it being this individual experience that we're all told that it is. Um, the licking will be done to, uh, and th this, this particular study was done in Switzerland uh, and uh, the Bavarian region of Germany. So they, the Swiss have a ant colony that has one feature that is unlike any other feature. It's an ant colony where multiple gene lines of ants live simultaneously. Um, usually they go to war and kill each other, but this, the, the one in the Alps, they work all together and they have these huge hives, like big, 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 big hives. Um, and there's millions and millions of queens. There's millions of queens in that hive, let alone the tens and hundreds of millions of ants. Um, and because there's so much life crawling through it that these ant piles generate a stupendous amount of heat. Um, and that in turn becomes a incubator for bacteria and viruses. So what these ants have done is they, they farm, um, they farm a resin from local trees and then they spit their formic acid on the resin and then they take the combination and then they clean each other with it and it has antimicrobial properties. So they're actually administering antibiotics to each other, which is between us and the ants, that's the only animals that actually do that to chemically synthesize an antibiotic, which is fascinating. Uh, but that's what's going on here. They're, they're cleaning each other to make sure that there's no infection. Um, and this is, this is ants whose brains are so small I can't even recognize that, right? So biology and neurology is a hell of a thing and trauma appears to be an important way to signal that whole process. But what about, what if you're severely maimed? What if you're like really mangled here? What if the trauma is just unbelievably severe? Um, because the call has to be made. You can't rescue every ant. You don't have the resources for it, for starters. Uh, so you gotta, you gotta have a filter here. Um, if you are severely wounded, if the ant loses like three, four limbs, the ant's gonna be in pain and it's flailing around. And it is sending the signal, but the problem is it's flailing around so much that its buddies can't help it. You can't put a flailing ant on your back. It's gonna fall off all the time. And so you have to make the call and say, well, this ant isn't flailing as much. I could actually save this one. And this one is just doomed. Now, that's interesting as well, because it's not like they're making a moral decision. It's not like they're saying, well, I'm going to save as many as I can. It's not utilitarianism. It's all locally there. The gradient of the chemical that's being expressed from the trauma, um, the whole battlefield is just immersed in it after the conflict. So it has to make these gradient-based decisions. Um, and then it has to assess really quickly, can I even pick that thing up? It's not making, again, it's not a utilitarian moral choice in this type of thing. So um, interestingly enough, one could extract that this exchange could be the birth of stoicism to a degree. The idea that, oh, well, I'm wounded or I'm hurt or I'm being traumatized by this thing that I can't control. And if I flail around about it, I'm not going to get the help I want. But if I'm kind of nonchalant about it, let it happen and sit and process it that might be a way to attract the help that I'm looking for. It's interesting. I don't know if that's true or not, but it is an interesting aside because ants are already doing it apparently. Uh, but yeah, they, uh, when they flail around, it's basically a death sentence, so. Okay, we got animals, we got mammals, we got critters that aren't mammals, We're getting somewhere. We're finally making some damn sense here. Trauma is starting to demonstrate functional purpose as opposed to being this miserable thing that happens to us and we're just doomed to live with it forever. Um, there's actually some neurological purpose here. What if it's natural? Let's, let's continue to make some assumptions here. Uh, what if trauma is natural? It's just, you're alive, there's trauma, that's the game. Um, what if it's functional and it's starting to demonstrate that it is? 
And what if it's required? That's the painful one. That's the real tough one. The idea that trauma is required. So let's look into how that could be. And we'll use evolutionary psychology. psychology. So where does this even come from? If we're, going to, if we're going to make these presumptions, where is the driver for this cognitive state coming from? Predator and prey. Eating. That's where it's coming from. And you can confirm this over and over again with studies like this, where you can take predator urine, spray it around mice, and they'll lose their shit. They'll demonstrate PTSD just by smelling the piss. That's interesting. That shows that it's, it's fundamental to the neurology because this is not fundamental to the neurology as much as it's, it is this relationship between predator and prey where trauma is originating from. And that's, a, that's an interesting idea uh, because that implies that certain types of trauma can be categorized a bit more correctly as opposed to uh, women hysteria and men who have shell shock and child sex uh, survivors. What if, if you get down to that fundamental about how much of the predator prey psychology are we still carrying with us, then we might be able to identify how our stress response and our trauma responses are formulating. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, right. So uh, likely effects on fecundity and survival are the norm in nature. And right? so the idea that it is beneficial for prey to go through trauma because it enhances their ability to survive against future predator attacks. So now we're getting to the actual function behind it. This, something can only exist if there's a benefit to a degree. You can have some maladaptive stuff as well. Um, but the maladaptive is still functional at the same time. And so how can that be? Right? That's a wild statement. And I'm, I'm going delving deep in the controversy here if, if we're still clinging to the idea that trauma is this deeply personal experience. Um, so just hang tight. I promise it'll make sense. So this is the, uh, the predator odor, uh, just, just smelling the odor, being aware of it, and, and kind of putting the prey in that type of state. Um, and this is, again, mapped at the brain level too. There's MRIs on all these animals that's showing the brain is actually doing these things. Uh, okay, so we've been, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a premature categorization here. Feel free to trash it and tell me I'm wrong all day long. I'm not going to strongly defend this categorization. Um, it's just to drive a concept home. And maybe you'll see some stuff and maybe you won't. So what we've been talking about, and from what I suspect, most of the trauma that we're describing that we go through individually is actually prey trauma, meaning we're describing trauma from the perspective of being predated upon. And that's only one half of the picture because predators go through trauma too. It's just they go through it differently. So let's look at it. Prey trauma. These are the four things that we associate with PTSD according to some variant of the DSM that I don't even believe in. Um, so there's hyperarousal, meaning when you go through the trauma, now all your senses are fired up. I'm now really looking around, right? I'm smelling things, I'm tasting things, I'm like alive more, right? So I'm like, whoa, this, I just got the shit kicked out of me. Oh, fuck, I'm amped up. Oh, you know, I'm fucking crazy. I'm hyper aroused at this point. Um, and what does that do? Why, why would that be a response to trauma? Well, it enhances your alertness. You just got chased by a predator. So you want to be aware that there are more predators behind me? Have I really outrun this thing? You know, you want to be, you want to take in and drink those details as much as you can so you can make the assessment that maybe, okay, maybe I can start toning it down a bit. Maybe I can, maybe it's safe to just chill for a second, right? So hyperarousal makes a ton of sense from the functional trauma standpoint in terms of uh, the evolution of it. Unwanted recurrent memories of distress. So flashbacks, right? Back in Nam, man, that type of stuff. But there's a, there might be a function to that too, because if you're forced to replay the experience over and over again, then you will be forced to then extract additional patterns and more associations from it. Shit you might have missed when you were too busy running. So you're running, you're like, oh God, this wolf's behind me. I'm not really taking in all the things around me. I'm just I'm dodging that tree. I'm jumping over that water. I'm doing all these things. Um, but maybe I missed something. Maybe I was running and I saw some ice and I was slipping around. Uh, and I, now the lesson is when I'm running from a predator, avoid ice because that's bad because it's going to fuck me up. 
So the only way to get that retrained into your brain is to have it forced into your experience over and over again. So now there's a function to what is a flashback. So let's keep going. Avoiding of associative, avoidance of associatives, where now you have the chance to practice what it is you're formulating in your mind. Or not, you're not formulating in your mind. Uh, you, you are demonstrating that you, you are physically demonstrating that you have learned some things from the trauma encounter. And what you're doing is you're avoiding the things you've associated. So going back to the ice example, you're running yourself on the ice. Now what you're gonna do is avoid ice from here on out. And they oh, that's predators and ice are a bad mix. I should avoid that. So now you're avoiding the things you're associating. And so what your, your body is naturally, um, it's naturally concluding, uh, or I should say, by associating it to predators, you are either enhancing your survivability in the next encounter, um, uh, or you're just batshit crazy and you made the wrong association. That happens too. It's not like there's an authority, a, a referee out here saying all your associatives are correct. Um, you're just gonna do the best you can with the limited you know, meat space you have. Um, but you will be avoiding those associatives as, as part of confirming that you have learned trauma-based learning. And then social detachment. This one's a little tough. I'm gonna wing this one. I'm probably wrong. Um, but I think because in the case of you know, rabbits and anything, uh, that's social by nature. Uh, and I realize the flaw of using social mammals here. Um, I think because uh, they are social and there's a lot of social stimuli going on all the time, uh, that detaching from the social so that you can then spend more time with the trauma. And so you can extract all the associatives from it. I think that's an important part of, of making sure and enhancing your survival for the next encounter. So you minimize your inputs as much as you can and say, okay, let me really process this and get what I want. So from the prey standpoint, trauma is actually really important for survival. If all of this holds, now the, the details are details, and again, I'm spitballing here as much as I can, but I'm, I'm presuming that there is neurological functional purpose behind the things we do. And from the perspective of Trey, uh, from Prey, it appears that trauma helps them survive. So let me catch my breath, because that's, huh, boy, that was physical. Uh, so predator trauma. Predators are doing the same thing. They have the same trauma responses here. But there's a key difference. For Prey, the trauma is personal. They do have to learn these new tricks to get better skill sets against future predation. So it's very individual. But predators, their trauma is intrinsically social. Now, why is that? So you'll see cases of monkeys and baboons and apes and all, the, all that family. Dogs, uh, killer whales, um, they're all having a different context for the same trauma. So they're actually filtering for different lessons. So for example, uh, there's, there's, a pack, there's a type of penguin. I forget which one it is. Um, and monkeys do this too. But there's a type of penguin I'm gonna focus on that steals from other penguins. So the penguins will get together and they'll make a nest. They'll take all the rocks and they'll make their nest out of the rocks. Now you can either go look for a rock and then add it to your nest, or you can steal the rock from other penguins. But when you steal the rock from other penguins, you want to make sure that the other penguins aren't around to see you do it. So there's deception and there's deflection going on, right? So I'm trying to hide the fact that I'm stealing from this thing so I don't violate any social uh, resource sharing type of things that I'm stuck in. So that's, a, that's, that's trauma. That's, that is effectively a form of trauma. Any psychologist will tell you if you're engaging in these type of behaviors, that's a traumatic response. Um, and animals are doing this. There are animals that steal from each other all the time. Uh, they'll steal from other species too, not just from the tribe. They don't want to get caught in the, in the predator-prey trap. So they're minimizing their exposure uh, to that. So they're clouding the analysis of the social situation to you know, maintain where they've been. Plotting also happens. This happens all the time in males. Oh my God, uh, and the alpha is there and the, the betas don't like it. And they plot and they form a pack and they kill the alpha. Monkeys do this all the time. Humans do this all the time. Um, but that's social trauma, right? That is, that is predator trauma. Um, it's needing. So again, chimps, I, I'm over relying on chimps here. Um, but sometimes people get exiled. Sometimes animals of the pack get exiled. Uh, 
they failed an attempt to take out the alpha, for example, so they get booted out. They'll come back pleading. They'll try for years in some cases to come back pleading. That's, that's predator trauma. Prey, prey doesn't really do that very much. Um, they don't try to get back in the pack, um, mostly, especially in the case for rabbit. Their life cycle is so fast, they're, they're either dead or they're not. Um, but predators are robust in terms of social arrangements. They have to work as a unit. Um, and all of these trauma points are ways to signal that something's wrong with the unit, something's wrong with the group. And so that's why, again, this is now functional. We're still in the realm of functional improvement, except that in this case, it's gone to the social cohesion as opposed to the individual uh, betterment from the prey side. Uh, naked aggression is very common, uh, snapping at people. But what you're doing in that naked aggression is you're demonstrating your pack utility, saying, I am still fierce, I am still useful in the hunt. Uh, and subservience is a, is a very common trauma where like, oh, this person's beating me, fucking stop, please. I will, I will, you know, I'll respect the alpha. Uh, and self-criticism. Now, not all predators are the same. There are, there's, uh, there's the, the run and chase predator, and then there's the ambush predator, like spiders or certain types of spiders. So they'll dig themselves in a hole and then they'll jump out, right? Um, they need to associate themselves in their environment to see if a camouflage works. So if they fail on a hunt, if they fail to spook someone consistently, uh, one, they're starving. They don't have food. They've expended a lot of energy to go get that food and that didn't work. So now they have to do like this proto self-criticism. Have I, have I properly blended into my environment? Now they're not doing this cognitively. I like the way I'm describing it, um, but there is the, the trace foundation of a self-criticism element is there. So this is, there are, there's overlap here too. It's not so cleanly separated. There are things, there are trauma responses that both predator and prey do, like for excessive grooming, for example. Both of these critters will do that, uh, whether it's a cat or whether it's a guinea pig. Um, excessive grooming is a common response when social trauma is available. Um, but what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to say that uh, there is at least, if, if we're going to accept that, there is, that trauma has a functional source and we're going to accept that the primary driver is the predator prey relationship, um, then it's probably worth exploring how uh, there might be differences to then, to then make some proper diagnosis here. So I'm going to go through a couple of examples. Um, well, first, just, we'll just walk through and summarize all the stuff I've been saying. Uh, it drives unlearning, unconscious learning. So it's not like a lesson. It's not like reciting with a teacher and saying, oh, yeah, then, you know, in 1773, some guy did a thing. It, it's more like trauma's there. It happens so fast in a predator-prey scenario, that you don't have time to actually sit and absorb all of it. Um, you have to get the hell out of the problem. Uh, so you're running really quick with your prey. Um, and so the only way to drive lessons from that experience is unconsciously. The repetition of memories. Um, uh, the, sorry, gotta go back to my notes. Um, Avoiding associatives to then practice the things you're extracting. Social detachment to enhance your extraction abilities. Hyperarousal to, to even see if the, if the predator is, is still there for the next account. So this is all unconscious things that your brain is, will do on your behalf without your permission. Um, and it's embedding. It's not memorized. It's embedding into your nervous response. That's an important part, too. And then when it's embedded, it's not recalled like, oh, I remember what I did Tuesday. It's replayed. So if you go back a couple slides, you'll see that a lot of the trauma people, they don't actually memorize the trauma, but they replay it all the same. They go through what has happened to them. And that makes sense if this is functionally true. They're going through it to extract additional patterns so that they don't get traumatized again, right? So you don't recall it like you're reciting from a test, you're replaying it because you're still not comfortable with the idea that you've taken all the lessons you need to take from it. And prey does this. Uh, then the replay memory adjusts behavior. That's what avoidance, social avoidance does and uh, the avoidance of the associative. So it's adjusting how you're interacting onward. Um, and that in turn, is a, that behavior affects your fitness. Do you read? Do you not read? Do you get food? Do you not get food? Do you help your tribe? Do you not help your tribe? All that trickles through it. And of course, that fitness is the driver of the trauma to begin with, the, the, the trauma relationship between predator and prey. And then around the circle we go, it's a circle of strife, right? So here we are. There's this 
this fully complete circle where the trauma is then selecting for how to avoid the trauma, but then uh, it's an arms race, which is why it's so difficult to dislodge. Um, so let's give some examples of all this stuff. Again, spitballing. Uh, please tell me why I'm wrong on this one. I'll be happy to do the research. Um, let's just give some examples here, right? So this critter shows up. It's hungry. It's mad. Um, it wants a piece of that rabbit, yo. Uh, but from the predator-prey relationship, the responses will be different. The rabbit, this is an irrational monster. It's ruining its day. It has kids to take care of, and this damn thing wants to eat all of them. This is not what I signed up for. I'm running, right? Uh, the wolf, on the other hand, looks at that and says, that's trash competition. I'll beat your ass. You're nothing to me. So the, the trauma response is different between the two players. A rabbit would never come to a conclusion that I could beat you. That thing is going to eat its family. It has a history of eating its family. So the conclusion it draws will be fundamentally different between the two players. Let's see another example. It's grass, right? It's how does prey look at grass versus how predator looks at grass? Well, prey obviously sees food. That's association in this case. And the prey sees the food's food. So they both sort of see food. One's indirect. So one is very like to grass, put in mouth, make association. The other one is, oh, my food eats here. So there's a, there's a layer of indirection that the predator then has to make the association of. And it can do that through predator trauma because if it starves, then it made the incorrect association of where the food, food came from. So then what if you start doing the human thing where you start experimenting with this type of natural response and you start playing social engineer or psychopath uh, and you start staggering the time and the distribution of the replaying of embedded memories. Can you modify fitness? And the answer is, of course you can. Um, so there's rabbit A and rabbit B, rabbit, you know, wolf A, wolf B. So um, on one half, if we take this group of rabbits, show them some wolves and some grass at the same time, what, or their focus is separate, they're going to say, oh, there's monsters. I'm like, no, there's food. That's a disagreement here, right? So they do they collectively make a choice? Do they individually make a choice? What do they do? They, they have options to pick from. There's no right or wrong answer. The context is very fluid at this moment. There's a wolf, there's some grass, what are you gonna do? Meanwhile, the wolf is doing, the wolf pack is doing the same thing. Oh, there's hints of food here, but oh no, these wolves I don't recognize are competitors as well. Things get sticky. It's not so cut and dry. This is where natural selection does its thing. Who's right, who's wrong? You don't know until the body count starts killing then there's your fitness. You've modified your fitness because the decisions that those individuals made determines the fitness later on it's in, the, in those mixed signal environments. And then sometimes, sometimes they'll switch perspectives. So this particular person, this particular entity used to be in the wolf pack, but maybe it screwed up. Maybe it made the wrong turn or it interfered somehow or it pissed off the alpha. Who knows what happened? But some severe trauma happened at some point where when the wolf looks at this grass, it starts taking on the properties of prey trauma instead. It'll start being hyper aroused. It'll start looking around. You'll see this in zoo animals. They'll start doing all the things. They'll start having prey trauma instead of predator trauma. Predator trauma is healthy for the predator because it's social adjustment and fine tuning for the pack. But if the wolf gets isolated, it's going to start demonstrating prey trauma. So then let's look at uh, semi novel threats. There's a wolf, there's a wolf with some glasses, there's a little mustache, cool hat, bandana, right? So this is semi-novel in the fact that it's all a wolf, but there's like slight modifications. Same thing, you can still modify the fitness here. Um, because even if you hide the fact that this is a wolf and you put these little cute things on it, the, the trauma, the, the associations are still being made. You know, there's monsters here. No, they're fake monsters. That's not a real wolf, it has a hat on. How can that possibly be a real wolf? So now, again, these, this, these complex decisions have to be made, and they, they, they are made in the natural selection space. Wolf might see competitors. The other one's like, that's, that's all fake competition. That's not real. That's not a real thing. But the natural selection still pans out based on the decisions that are made. Things might disappear. There goes that player, too. But then the severe trauma of trying to make that decision might switch one player to then start having trauma of the other. This can happen. This has been known to happen. You'll, again, you'll see this with zoo animals. You'll see this in hyperaggression. Uh, prey do demonstrate hyperaggression sometimes. They demonstrate predator trauma. Uh, 
rabbits are known to fight each other constantly and not for mating reasons either. So the next slide, I'm just gonna walk you through it. And I'm just gonna show it. I'm not gonna say a word. We're just gonna see what happens. So good luck. You can affect the fitness of people over a long amount of time just by trauma training. One event, as long as it's common and semi-novel, you can make people switch their trauma response to full prey if you need to. It's totally possible. That's it. That's my wild conjecture. Uh, you know, feel free to criticize away. I'm probably wrong on a lot of the fundamentals, but I'm open for uh, wild assaults against my character. <laughs> um, no wild assaults on people's character at the, the Dark Stoa, my friend. Uh, so if you have a, a question for Pat, just write it in the, the chat box and uh, I'll read it on your behalf if you want me to or just unmute yourself. Um, yeah, something, lots of stuff came up there, but one thing came up was uh, your mention of Stoicism and sort of its potential evolution. And the thought of uh, virtue came to mind, being virtuous. Um, and I, I was jamming with someone recently, and we're talking about the kind of like the, and you and I were chatting about this too, like the kind of the axiomatic principle or foundation of stoicism is being, living in accordance with nature. Or I like our friend Jordan Hall, um, he says being right relationship with reality. And if you're in right relationship with reality, you're in right relationship with everything, including the fight or flight response. And what comes to mind is being virtuous is being in right relationship with the fight or flight response. Um, so I, I just wanted to throw that out there to you. And if you have any thoughts on that or virtue itself. You're, you're on mute. Um, the argument I've been making is that trauma is so abundant and so abundantly present across species that calling it trauma is just as bad as calling it hysteria. I think in, because of that, um, the idea of virtue and being in right accordance I don't want to nitpick on words because my, my, my brain wants to go there and that's just, that's poor virtual signaling. But, um, but the idea of being right implies an information problem that I don't have enough information to make the right decision. Um, and so every individual has to make the decision that their local context is telling them and the processes and the means in which that decision making uh, and that sense making dance is evaluating. Um, trauma does have a role in that according to the presentation that I'm trying to put out there at least, uh, that the idea that um, am I in a right relation with the moment? Am I, have I correctly assessed that I am no longer being predated upon? Or have I correctly assessed that uh, I am being predated upon validly? Uh, those, are, those are things that our brains are constantly looking for in one manner or another. Um, the the virtue signaling sounds like social trauma to me, personally. And I, I'm using the word trauma because that's the word we I don't think trauma is the right word, personally. I don't think it's the right word. I'm just using it because that's the part. Um, when someone is emitting virtue, what they're doing is it's emitting subservience to the alpha. Um, they're saying, I am, I am in accordance to the pack's efficiency. Uh, so please don't dislodge me from the resource access the pack gives me. 
And so that's, that's, the, that's the hard, brutal, like abysmal science approach. Uh, now, if I step back and I talk about the ideals you're talking about uh, from the perspective of the ideals, um, one thing that's not covered very well in the predator-prey relationship is the idea of self-sacrifice. That's not really abundantly well studied. Um, in the case of like ants and termites, they have self-destructive crazy chemicals that just ruin any invader. And so they, you got too close and then boom, now you're covered in acid that's gonna ruin your life, right? So that's kind of a self-sacrifice. Um, but the idea of self-sacrifice is a, it's almost like a, it's, I don't know whether it's a well-defined stoic ideal or it's a virtue, um, but I do know that when you demonstrate it, it can induce traumatic response in all who are watching. Now, sometimes that traumatic response can be good, and sometimes it could be, you know, whatever you're angling for. Um, I can't give you a clear answer on this one, unfortunately. Uh, and it does sound like I'm trying to contrive this into the pitch that I just made. I recognize that. Um, uh, but um, I, it, it, to get to ideals, um, ideals are so far down the line from the intrinsic predator-prey formation of cognition. So I, I have to like walk through each and every one of them before I can get to the, to that ideal space. Mm -hmm. um, do you think it's possible, like you said, the subservient aspect of the predator to prey dynamic? Do you think it's possible to be subservient to a higher ideal, like the truth yes. or Jesus yes. or whatever? Yes. yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Because it's, um, it's a little bit of perception theory, but because because of the way, whether it's, whether it's learning in the formal sense or that unconscious learning in which trauma is heavily leveraging, um, in either case, you have to make judgments from incomplete positions. And you have to be right. How do I know the predator's not chasing me? I just can't like, you know, hey, Google, is the predator still on my ass? I can't do that, right? So I have to make decisions about my own life, which I only got one of because I'm a rabbit running. Uh, I only got one. I got to make the decision that that thing's not chasing me anymore. So I can now go poop and pee and stuff like that. Right? So um, we're, we're, neurology appears to be selecting for means to make valid decisions from incomplete spaces. Hmm. And sometimes the artifact of that incompletion can be represented very cleanly in a belief or an ideal. And once it fits there, then all of the traumatic responses will interact with that ideal and belief as if uh, it was as valid as a reality construct. So I think, yes, you, you, could, you can have a predator-prey relationship, you can have a prey trauma and predator relationship trauma, a predator trauma relationship with ideals that happen to correspond with making decisions from incomplete spaces. So um, we're, we're at the hour mark already, we're at the, the hour, uh... Are you, you cool to stay about 15, 20 minutes to field a few questions? Yeah. Sure. Um, so if anyone has to leave, feel free to leave. Uh, but um, there's a lot of good questions here. So let's uh, uh, do Daniel, if you can kind of unmute yourself and ask uh, your questions to Pat. Yeah, I don't have the option. Okay. Yeah. Let me. Uh, now you have the option to unmute yourself, Daniel. Okay. Thanks, Pat. Um, yeah. I, I had a thought when you when you map things out in the predator and prey dynamic, in my mind, it could potentially map to also a master slave or sadist masochist dynamic. And so my mind went to this question, maybe you can riff on it. What does your definition of trauma say about sexual desire and power dynamics in adult relationships? Uh, yes, there is a lot of overlap there because of the predator prey model. Um, to answer this question, I have to make a presupposition uh, that the trauma we are experience, it, that we are experiencing is indicative of the structural limitations of neurology itself. And what I mean by that is that the reason we have the trauma we have is because the way in which the brain has to operate as an efficient machine in terms of 
fuel and resource input, uh, self-consistent management, and then output into behavior that then guarantees the brain can keep going. That's a, uh, that's a very complicated dance. And so in that dance, that very complicated dance, you're gonna come up with a wide variety of different behavioral outcomes and processes that can then drive those behavioral outcomes. In the event of the predator prey stuff that I'm talking about, that's just one subset. Uh, mating habits is totally driven by very similar types of limitations and social habits as well. Um, all of these drivers intrinsically have to deal with the physical space. It's not just abstractions. To most animals, the universe is not an abstraction. It's a real and only thing. It is a monad of all that could possibly exist. So uh, you will have overlaps of violence in the social and the sexual space. And depending upon uh, the neurological evolution of each creature, that's gonna manifest sometimes in wild ass ways. Uh, like for example, when there's the praying mantis. You know, it's like, oh, you're gonna mate with me and I'm gonna eat your head. <laughs> you know, to thinking humans, that's absurd. Um, but the, the trauma is selecting for ways to minimize its exposure because it's having an effect on what is allowed to propagate, what did survive the predator. You know, it's like this exception-driven duct tape ball that trying to express in any type of systemic way is just kind of pure madness. Um, so it's just, I'm describing a fundamental mechanism of the selection. I couldn't tell you what all the selections are or the accumulation of it. I can tell you what a programming language is, but I couldn't tell you what every program is. It's like that. So, um, Regarding, regarding mating selection, uh, social interaction, predator-prey relationships, I think they're borrowing from each other's toolkits a lot. There's going to be a lot of reuse and overlap here. I, I hope that answers your question. As like a quick follow-up, I think the, the piece I'm curious about is um, it's, it's also found in Stockholm Syndrome, like in, in a dynamic where it seems like an organism is going back to the traumatic event or they've repurposed it as sexual desire or something like that, which isn't necessarily the, like not everyone agrees with that premise, but I just thought I'd throw it in there. Yeah, it's, it's feasible that during the replaying of the trauma uh, that the social and the sexual um, uh, contexts are also being trained at the same time. Uh, it's not just purely the predator and prey. Uh, the brain is, is very limited space to, to freely experiment. Uh, even with neuroplasticity, it's not as if the brain is, is turning you into a chair. It's, it, has, it has to deal with very specific inputs and outputs. It, your glucose and your oxygen consumption is very tightly monitored here. Um, so it has to play with those, the, within the bounds of that resource. So it makes sense to have some sharing. But it, like I said, there is no, there is no referee on what associatives are valid and which ones aren't. Uh, that's up for natural selection to figure. That's, that's, a, that's a uncomfortable thing for humans because we have this idea that we can always make things better, but life is, life is hard sometimes. Um, and not everyone wins. I mean, we're all gonna die, so we don't win, right? So, I mean, that's that. But, but I think you're gonna see because of the resource constraints and the fact that there isn't a referee of what associatives are valid, uh, you're, you're gonna see sharing of these techniques. Okay. Um, Irene. Would you like to unmute yourself and ask Pat your question? I can, I'll unmute you. There you go. Thank you. Hi, hi everyone, thank you. So yeah, I agree that PSD symptoms and a lot of reactions are a mechanism of self-protection to survive in that hostile or terrible environment. But what about little children that are pre-verbal that have attachment trauma where the parent is, there's not sexual trauma, but the parent, um, mm -hmm. it's emotional abuse, the parent is there, then they're absent, they may have depression themselves. What about intergenerational trauma? So these are inherited responses to traumas that you can't really consciously process, which is what's happening with First Nations right now. How does that fit into your model? So the, because the, the predator trauma is intrinsically social, um, predators tend to have this, and I'm saying tend, I can't say all, but um, they tend to have this feature where they have to very carefully manicure their youth, their young. Uh, 
They can't just dump 10,000 babies and just kind of like, ah, well, y'all figure it out. Um, the wolf has to very carefully take care of its child. Uh, we have to take care of their well, probably not in the case of wolf families, but, um, but we have to take care of our children. Elephants have to take care of their children. Monkeys have to take care of their children. So the, the, the predator trauma response of either failing to get prey uh, or failing to negotiate the resource distribution of the tribe uh, intrinsically leads to these family formations for pack efficiency. Uh, that's just the way the trauma kind of the trauma response methodology in the ecosystem tended towards. So it does make sense that if there is a uh, a familial bond that is shattered in advance of this association, um, excuse me, and it is allowed to persist, that's where things get sticky. That's where things get real tough, because in where you have a lot of these tribal creatures, if there is a social bond that is disrupted or a social trauma, a predator trauma has been activated, uh, they will make it their prime priority to solve that shit right there. They won't sit there. And some of them might sit there and linger. You see that with the, with the betas and the exile. Uh, they, they do that lingering revenge fantasy type of thing. Uh, wolves do this against the alpha a lot. But it's, it can't be buried forever. It does express itself. Uh, so social traumas... Um, lead to intergenerational trauma. But intergenerational trauma is only feasible if the social trauma is allowed to happen, uh, is allowed to persist, and you can't resolve it, which naturally predators do. They will resolve these traumas and they won't let them sick and, and let them infest and linger. Um, so I would say that the concept of intergenerational trauma is only possible when you have so much resource abundance that you don't care if someone's traumatized because there's just more opportunity tomorrow. Did you have a follow-up question to that, Irene? Uh, a few concerns in, in terms of learning, because I think um, there's different forms of trauma. So if it's like a freeze response, you're frozen out of your neocortex, or you're frozen out of your uh, problem solving. So that's how I see it. So I'm not sure. I think you see it a little bit differently than I do. So I don't it's, see it. I don't see that you learn that quickly from trauma. No, it's, it's not, it's not like, it's not like you learn quickly. This isn't, this isn't like the trauma file is on the hard drive and now it's permanently there in the search database. It's, that's not, it's not what I'm saying. Um, what I'm saying is that because of the limitations of the brain, its ability to uh, have things grafted into it to a point that it's affecting your very complicated behavior, that takes time. That's why you need to do the social distancing and that's why the replaying is happening. It's because of the limitations of having this really flow through your entire being so that the lesson is now part of your muscle memory. That takes time. Um, and every type of social trauma that does manifest uh, when, it's, when a person is going through it and then signaling to others that the trauma is there, freezing, for example, um, that's intrinsically social too. Uh, it's, it's the individual going through it, right? That's the mythology that all the trauma is individual and nothing else matters. But the individual is demonstrating trauma is happening to the tribe and the tribe has to then make a call do we deal with this now or do we just say screw it there's infinite resources we don't care about you um and that's so yes yes i i, I, would, I would agree that the idea of uh, efficiencies in terms of speed efficiency that's that's not what i'm promoting at all so let's maybe do uh, one last question uh devinder you had a question about depression Where are you, Devinder? I'm going to unmute you. There you go. <clears throat> Devinder, you're unmuted. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Hey, man, what's up? Yeah, so how, how does a depressive disorder fit into the repeated trauma model? So what about depression that goes away? You learn from it and bounce back versus a depression that never goes away. Say you commit suicide or, or something like that. Yeah, so again, the, um, because there's no referee of associatives, as a result, it's not as if you've made enough associatives and you can walk away. Like, oh, I made 20 associations about all the lessons I learned from my trauma, and now I can walk it off. Well, who I did it, give me my medal. Um, there, there's no authority out there to say that you found enough lessons and that you're comfortable enough to actually step back and engage. Um, that's gonna be up to a combination of social factors and biochemistry that is just a wild ass dance. Um, uh, you can engage in type of therapeutical responses uh, to mitigate that to a degree, whether that works or not is again, that's 
it's more of a probabilistic hedge fund approach as opposed to a you know take this pill and then you'll be fine uh, but the uh if my guess is that if we look at the predator prey thing uh, as some type of guidance again not the de facto standard just as a method of guidance um, if i am constantly trying to extract additional associations from the trauma um, then i know or i feel or i believe that i'm not i i am I have not learned all of the things that have happened from this, and I am not in a space where I can even continue until I go until I keep going. Um, that sounds like a viable outcome, given how the brain is trying to organize itself. It may be compulsively trying to extract associatives, um, and that would be where I would look at in terms of like you know neurological disorder if if I had to put a, a drug reference to something. Cool. Uh, okay, I'm gonna stop there. Um, so uh, before I make any closing announcements, Pat, do you have any uh, final thoughts to share on this? Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, like I said, this is um, this is my ongoing campaign to strike at all things uh, Western science because I think it just needs to be done. They've had a good run. I, I'm still bitter about a lot of the things that they've decided and pushed under the rug. So this is just a, a yet another expression of me taking a crack shot, uh, a crack shot at that type of direction. Uh, so my bias is out there in the open and obvious. As a result of being biased, obviously I'm going to make some mistakes, I'm going to make some wild uh, associations that shouldn't be made, so take that accordingly. Uh, but I'm always free uh, for exception-driven stuff. Uh, I'm always free for any type of question or concern or criticism about this. Uh, hopefully this, again, I'm, my goal here is to say, let's kind of back off from trauma as the personal uh, and let's look at it in context as a functional response from either uh, why the individual goes through it and then what that means for social response to it. And I think if you look at that systemically, you'll start to reorganize approaches to trauma, perhaps ideally in a more effective manner. Hmm. Very cool. Um, so we're going to stop there. Uh, I'll make some announcements in a moment. But Pat, thanks so much for coming on the Dark Stoa Friday nights with Pat. <laughs> um, yeah, for upcoming events, uh, go to the Stoa.ca. Uh, the next one is going to be staying inside solitude and cultivating uh, interior life with Greg Sadler. Um, that's at 1 p.m. Eastern time, and then freestyling through a pandemic at. Uh, um, 8 p.m. Eastern time with Tyson Wagner. And so basically we're going to do like this freestyle rap <laughs> um, and, uh, and with wisdom, obviously. And uh, Daniel, you have a, um, a meta game mastermind. Do you want to unmute yourself and just talk about that briefly? Sure. Yeah. So we're, we're prototyping how to create digital gangs to help people develop sovereignty and respond to the meta crisis. So tomorrow at 6 p.m. Eastern, we're having another session on that. Cool. Thank you, Daniel. And uh, the Stoa is based off a of gift economy. Uh, I'm, I'm viewing it as a, a gift to the world in this time of need. Uh, and if there's any demonic inspiration bubbling up to provide a gift to the Stoa, um, just visit that website and there, find out more information there. That being said, uh, thanks everyone for coming out today. And Pat, you cool to, to stay on the line for? Cool.